Stanford University. CS193P, spring of 2020. This is lecture six. And today I'm going to cover two brief topics, either brief because they're minor topics like property observer, or I'm only going to get into so much detail on them, like at sign state. And then we're going to dive into our main topic today, which is animation, which is what our demo is going to be all about. So let's get started. Property observers, I'm only going to do a quick word on this. The main thing I want you to understand about property observers is it's just a way to watch a bar and see when it changes and then take some action. Now, a lot of times people get confused between property observers and computed bars. They're completely different things, nothing to do with each other. Here I have this var is face up, which has a property observer on it. That var is stored in memory. It's not a computed var in any way. In the property observer there, will set, I'm just watching for when is face up is going to be set. And if the new value it's going to get is set, so in other words, the thing is going to face up, then for example, in this case, like maybe in our memorized game, I'm going to start using bonus time, start the little pie behind our emoji, start it ticking. And if the is face up is just about to be set to false, I'm going to stop using the bonus time. So the new value in here, that purple thing, that's a special var that only appears in the will sets here. And of course, there's a did set. I'll use that one in the demo just to be different. Inside that one, old value is what the value used to be before it changed. All right, for this next topic, I want to explain something that's not obvious about what's going on. And I haven't really talked about this before. But your view, like card view and your emoji game view, they're all read only. In other words, if you looked at the top view in all of Swift UI on your device, there's a let there. And you might think that's impossible. How can we not be changing views or changing them all the time? But we're not. They're read only. And that means that having a var that's stored in our view is kind of useless. We can't set its value anyway. The only exception is vars that are set when you create the view. So like in card view, we have is face up. It's set by people who create us. So that kind of makes sense for that to be a var. But anything else that's not set that way, it might as well be a let. Or if it's a computer var, it definitely just wants to be a read-only computer var, which is the only kind of computer vars we've had so far. Why? Why are they all read-only? Well, functional programming, one of the awesome things about it is that it's very clear about mutability. When can this be changed? And there's a huge premium on good designs to having things be immutable. When things are immutable, nobody's changing it behind the scenes or doing something that is messing up the provability that your code actually works. And also, when things are immutable or immutable, when they change, you know they change and you can do something about it. That's how we can use these property observers on value type so effectively. In the case of Swift UI, it wants to be knowing when things are changing. And when they're changing, it wants to do the minimum amount of work to replace the view hierarchy with the right views. And in fact, that is what's happening. If is face up changes, it makes a new card view that has that. So that is how this is all working. This is actually a wonderful thing for you. <laughs> you might not think so. The fact you can't have read write vars is really good because remember that your views are supposed to be stateless. They're supposed to always be reflecting what the state of the model is. That's where the state is, is in the model. So views shouldn't need any state of their own, right? No need for them to be not read only. Well, mostly, and not 100% true. So let's talk about when views do need some state. And there are a few rare times. When it does need state, it's always temporary. Views never have any long-term storage. That's always going to be in your model. This is just temporary situations where you might need a little storage. What are some examples of temporary storage you might need? Well, you might enter an editing mode where you're going to collect some data from the user and gather it up and then call an intent to change the model with that data you collected or whatever. So just temporarily you're collecting it. You might be displaying another view, some other view that is collecting some data like the text field or a picker like we saw in that post in Piazza or a view that's an alert 
you know, you're giving the user alert and you just want to keep track of the fact that it's up until the user hits cancel. Then you're like, ah, it's gone. And so you're just having a bool whether that thing is up or not. That's kind of really tiny temporary data. Or an animation, animation only reflects things in the past. So if you want to have an animation that's kind of going along with the present, you have to have a little bar, which is the future. So you can set that bar to the future and the animation will start animating towards the future. Hopefully you're setting the future to be the same thing that's going to eventually be in your permanent state. But you're, it's only, you're only using that var during the time the animation is happening. And we know the animations are short. They're little temporary things. So animation is another case of these temporary storage. And we'll see doing that in the demo. We can, in fact, create storage in our read-only views. And we do it by marking a var that stores the information we want with at sign state. So at sign state. You know, like at sign published, at sign observed object, it's a property wrapper. Note that I've marked this state private. That's because state is private to you. It's just temporary storage you're using in your view. Nobody else is going to be looking at it. So by marking it private, you just kind of remind yourself, yeah, yeah, this is a little private temporary state right there. And of course, the type of this thing can be any type. It, you're just declaring a var basically here that's going to be read write, but it can be any type that you want. An important thing to understand about this state var, something temporary here, is if I change it, my view might get redrawn. If my view depends on something temporary and it changes in a way that makes my body draw differently, it'll get redrawn. It's the same as observed object, right? We do observed object on our view model. If the view model changes in a way that would make our view look different, it's going to get redrawn. Same thing with state, which is kind of a cool feature of it, actually. The space for this at sign state var is going to be allocated in the heap. It has to. It can't make the space in your view. Your view is read only. So it's basically making a pointer. So your view has a pointer in it and it points into the heap. And when your view gets rebuilt, because your view is getting rebuilt all the time, when it is space up changes in your card view, you got to make a new card view. And when that happens, this pointer gets moved to the new version. So you're still pointing at that same thing in the heap. So if is face up changes, your card view is not going to lose its temporary storage. Basically, your temporary storage will stay around even as other things that are causing your view to even be completely rebuilt. You get to keep your at sign state. We're going to learn what these at sign things are, you know, at sign published, at sign observed object, at sign state, they're called property wrappers. You can read about it in the, your reading. I think it's a sign for next week. I'm going to explain it eventually in lecture. Not quite yet though, almost there. For now, just know that you can mark a var with at sign state and now you can write to it, but use this sparingly and certainly never put anything that's not temporary in there. All right, main topic of the day is animation. What is animation? Well, it's essentially a kind of a smoothed out portrayal in your UI over a period of time, which is configurable by the way, of a change that has happened in your UI already. When the user looks at an animation, they're seeing something that has already changed in the model. Okay, or it's already changed somewhere. At the very least, it's changed in an at sign state. Something that's already happened. It can't do it any other way. It, otherwise, all your variables in your model would have to be constantly changing as the animation went on. That's just untenable architecture, right? So your model changes, it, your view changes, and that change gets animated in front of the user's eyes. So it's showing you their very recent past. The point of animations is to make the user experience less jerk, herky jerky, obviously, but also to draw attention to things change. We want to use the user's peripheral vision to notice, oh, that number over there changed. Oh, that mo view moved over here, whatever. That is what we use animation for, and that's why we have animation. It also just makes for a more pleasant, less stressful experience to have something jumping on the screen at you all the time. So in SwiftUI, what can get animated? Well, I'm going to talk about what can get animated, but first I want to make it clear that animation only works for views that are in a container that is already on screen. So if they're in a container that's already on screen and a change happens to them, what kind of change can be animated? Well, the appearance and disappearance of views, again, only if they're in a container that's already on screen. 
Also, changes to the arguments of animatable view modifiers, like opacity and rotation, things like this, that those view modifiers know how to animate themselves, and we're going to create one of our own today. Those changes to those arguments can be animated. And also the changes to arguments of the creation of shapes. If you create a shape with certain arguments, configure it in some way, and then you change those, then it can be animated to go to a new state. So how do we kick off an animation? By the way, that's it for change. There's nothing else going to be changed, just view modifiers, shapes, and the appearance and disappearance of views. I'll make that clear. All right, so how do we make an animation go? Well, there's two ways to do it. One is an implicit animation where we're going to just mark a view and say, whenever one of the modifiers on this view changes, we're going to animate that change. So that's implicit animation. It's going to automatically, every time that modifiers on that view change, it's going to animate it. The second one is explicitly where we are going to call some code that is going to result in some changes to view modifiers or shapes or views are going to be coming and going. And we're going to wrap that code by calling this function with animation. And inside the curly braces there, we're going to put the code. And that's going to cause all the things that would change, all those view modifier arguments that change, all the views that come and go, they're all going to happen together in one concurrent animation. So we're explicitly animating right there. We're saying, animate this and then we usually do something like call an intent in our view model and we know that's going to make a lot of changes we want the result of that to all be animated together so that's explicit animation so let's talk about the implicit animation first some people call this automatic animation and it essentially just declares or tags a view so that all view modifier arguments are always animated for this view you get to specify how these things happen, like how long it takes for them to happen, and also a curve, which I'll talk about. So you, so you do get to control it a little bit. You do it by calling this function animation on any view. So here I've called it on a opacity and rotation modified text of a ghost. I've said animation provided the argument there, which is the how to the do the animation, how long and all that stuff. And now forevermore, whenever the scary var changes and thus the opacity changes or the upside down var changes there in rotation effect, that's gonna change the rotation. Anytime those changes happen, it's going to animate it because this view, this combination of things here in green is now implicitly animated. That's always going to be ca the case that that happens. A warning here, a little red word, warning, so pay attention. Dot animation on a container view does not work how you would generally think. You might imagine it's just going to animate the whole container, like one big somehow blob of change, but it doesn't. All of doing dot animation on a container does is just applies that animation to all the things inside the container. In other words, dot animation is not like dot padding, right? The pa dot padding puts padding around the whole Z stack or the whole V stack or whatever. It's more like dot font, where if you say dot font on a Z stack, all the texts inside the Z stack get that font. Okay, animation is more like that font. If you say animation on a Z stack, all the things inside are going to get that. And that's rarely what you actually want, surprisingly. And so I'm just giving you a warning that we don't usually put dot animation on container views. They're usually put on, if not on leaf views, at least on very small self-contained views. So that animation argument that you're passing there, you saw in the previous slide, it was ease in, ease out, it's called. That lets you control the animation, like its duration. How long is this gonna take? Two seconds or whatever. A delay, wait a half a second before you start this animation. It can repeat a certain number of times or even repeat forever. Just do the animation to make this change and then just keep doing the animation over and over. The change, of course, has already been made in the past, but just keep doing the animation. Sometimes you want to do that. And also you can set the animation's curve. So what is an animation curve? This is actually determined by what kind of animation you choose. And the animation curve controls the rate at which the animation plays out. 
the linear animation, for example, the rate is constant throughout the whole time. The whole animation from you know, one opacity to another or from one rotation to another happens linear, constant rate. Then this ease in, ease out that I mentioned on the previous one, it's different. It starts out slow, slowly changing the opacity of the rotation and then speeds up. And then as it's almost there, it slows back down. And why do you want something like that? Well, if you're, for example, moving a card across screen from one place to another, it's kind of abrupt if it just picks up, moves over. It's much nicer for it to start moving slow and then move over and then slow down as it's arriving. And it's kind of like an airplane, right? Starts on the runway, stop, and it's slowly taking off. And then it goes in the air and it goes to 500 miles an hour. And then it gets to the destination airport and it slows down to 100, 150 miles an hour and it lands. So it's that kind of curve of the rate is easy and ease out. You almost always want things that are moving to at least do ease and ease out, if not the next one, which is spring. So spring is the thing gets to its destination and then it kind of bounces a little bit, it has a little soft landing there, it overshoots the mark a little bit and springs back a little bit like it's got a spring connecting it to the destination. And these kinds of animation curves make the UI a little more comfortable for users, less you know jarring, less abrupt. So let's talk about implicit animation, when a, the thing I was just describing, and explicit animation, which is what I'm going to describe next. So these automatic in the implicit animations, they're not really even the primary way we do animation. It probably depends on the app a little bit, but mostly we don't use them that much because when you have a, a kind of a group of views, they want to work together to animate. That's why putting dot animation on a container like a Z stack, not just, we just don't do it very much because if a Z stack has a whole bunch of views inside of it, maybe views inside those and this big construction, those views want to animate, animate all together, all together, all the same duration, all the same curve. They want to be in sync. Explicit in animation is where we cause an animation to happen all with the same duration, all with the same curve, for a whole bunch of views. And the way we do it is we just take this with animation function, call it with this argument, which is a closure. Inside the closure, we're just gonna do something like call an intent on our view model. That's a classic thing we, we, we do there. And the model's gonna change like crazy. Our view might change like crazy. And all those crazy changes are all gonna happen together with this animation that we passed to with animation. Here I'm doing two second linear animation. So all of the changes are gonna happen at a linear rate over the course of two seconds. Now I'm calling a function here with animation. I have two arguments an animation and then a closure. Calling functions like this, that's more of an imperative approach to programming. We know the Swift UI is mostly declarative. We're just saying the state of everything and the implicit animations are declarative. You're just declaring when these modifiers on this thing change, you're going to animate it. But this is actually imperative. Here we are telling somebody, do this and animate it. So it's imperative. So there's not a lot of places in the Swift UI code where you're doing imperative programming. Remember, all this code has to be in your view because view models don't see the view, so they can't be doing this. This is all in your view. It's in the spots in your Swift UI code where you do imperative code, which is like on tap gesture. The user tapped, boom, you're gonna do something imperative. You're gonna say, choose the intent, choose card or whatever. And those are the places on things happening, like on tap, tap gesture, other gestures we're gonna learn about next week. That's when we're going to call with animation. Now, explicit animations, are, as I said, are usually wrapped around things like intents, okay, view model intent, but you might also wrap it around something that happens only in the UI. For example, that editing mode I was talking about, let's say you're going into editing mode and little icons will appear to delete things or whatever, those things want to kind of animate smoothly and appear on screen. And so you might be doing with animation when the user hits the button to to say enter edit mode or whatever. Another imperative place is the action of a button. 
And we'll all show buttons today in the demo as well. And you'll see the action of the button, another place we do imperative code and where we would likely do something like with animation. This is red again, it's the second red thing. First one was the red about doing dot animation on container views. This one is uh, to remind you that explicit animations do not override implicit animations. Implicit animations are assumed to be on views that are self-contained, they work independently. Whatever animation makes sense for them should always make sense for them, no matter what. So if there's a view and it has an implicit animation attached to it, then it's going to be doing that implicit animation whenever it's things change. Even if there's an explicit animation going on at the same time, it's going to have no effect on them. Implicit animations always win. Now transitions specify how to animate the arrival and departure of views. Remember, those views have to be in containers that are already on screen, but whenever you arrives, you want to be able to animate it, fade in or flies in from outer space or something. You want some sort of animation for that view arriving. Now, a transition is only a pair of view modifiers. That's all it is. One of the view modifiers is modifying the view for what it's supposed to look like when it's there. And the other one is modifying the view for what it's supposed to look like when it's not there. In other words, it hasn't arrived or it just left. The one that's on there is probably going to have, let's say it's a fade. It'll start with the one that the view modifier where it's on there, opacity one. And then the view modifier, the other one is opacity zero. And system is going to animate between those two view modifiers to make that thing appear or disappear. So a transition is really just a version of changes the arguments in view modifier because the transition is just this pair of modifiers when you the two modifiers are going to have different arguments and so that's it that's all it is so transition is not really a different kind of animation it's just a way of specifying these two view modifiers for when views appear and disappear so how do we specify what transition we want the system to use when it's animating the appearance or disappearance of a given view now remember, a transition is just a pair of modifiers, so we're essentially just going to attach the two modifiers we want, the modifier for when it's on screen and the modifier for when it's not, to a view. And we attach the, this transition using dot transition. Very simple view modifier. I'm going to show you by example here, and I'm going to use two built-in transitions. One's called dot scale, that's the blue one there, and the other one's called dot identity, which is the purple one. So a dot scale transition, its two view modifiers are frame modifiers. And the off-screen one has a frame of zero, and the on-screen one has a frame of like full size, whatever its normal size is. So a scale transition zooms the view in and out from tiny zero size up to full size as it goes out or in. And an identity transition is an interesting one. Its view modifier does nothing. So since nothing is changing between when it's gone and when it's there, it just instantly appears and instantly disappears. In other words, there's no animation because there's no differences between the two view modifiers they are exactly the same and they don't actually modify the view. So there's no animation to happen. So bloop, it disappears and disappears. And it is occasionally the case that when you're doing an animation and you have views coming and going, possibly you might want a view to just bloop, appear and bloop, disappear and not be animated. And that's not the default. So the default transition is called dot opacity, which is a fade, fades in and out, right? It's just taking the opacity, which we learned about last time, making go from one to zero when it goes out and from zero to one when it goes in. So the view modifier in that case is the opacity view modifier. Let's look at this uh, Z stack right here. It's basically our card kind of simplified here. There's only so much room on these slides. And you can see that from my face up, the front of my card, I got my rounded rectangles, let's say. Don't have them all specified there, but you know what they are. And I didn't put a dot transition modifier on the rounded rectangles. So, so they're going to get the default transition, which is opacity. So the rounded rectangles in the front are going to fade in and out as they come and go. But I did put a transition on the text of the little ghost there. That is going to zoom up out of nowhere and then zoom back down to zero size when it goes away. That's what dot scale means. And then the rounded rectangle on the back, 
I put the transition identity, that means when the back appears, it's just gonna bloop appear. It's not gonna fade in or grow out, or it's just gonna bloop appear. Now it'll be bloop appear, and meanwhile, the front will be fading out and zooming, shrinking down at the same time. So it's not gonna be a very nice animation. This is kind of a kitchen sink animation here. You would never do it that actually like this, but I just want you to understand what all these transitions do. By the way, you see here how is face up, which is just a conditional inside of a view builder, right? This is a Z stack. We know the content for Z stack is a view builder. And inside view builder, it's a list of views, but we can use if thens to include or not include some. Well, of course, as we include them, they appear on screen. As we don't include them, they disappear on screen. And these kind of if thens inside of view builders is probably the number one way the views are coming and going. So when you have animations of the contents of some view builder thing like this Z stack, and it's got conditionals in there, you want to think about transitions because those things are going to be coming and going. And if you don't think about it, you're going to get fade in and fade out. That's the default. But you might want something that looks a little better than that. Another way that views come and go is, for example, in a for each. So for, for each takes an array of identifiable things and makes views for them. Well, if that array changes, like new things got added to it or some of the identifiers got pulled out, it's going to either add new views or take some of the views it made in the past out of there, and those views are gonna be coming and going. You're gonna see this definitely in your homework number three. You're gonna have your cards somehow displayed on screen through some for each, maybe inside grid or something, and it's a different game than memorize. The cards kind of come and go in the game you're doing, whereas memorize the cards are just really always on screen. Even when they're matched, they're just hidden. There's just kind of a space for them there, but wouldn't have to be that way. So those are probably the number one and number two ways that views come and go. Conditional things inside view builders and things like for each that are conditionally, essentially building views for you. All right, back to the screen code. So let's just walk through. If we changed is face up, from one thing to the other, what would happen? So if we changed is face up to false, in other words, we want to show the back, the back would instantly appear because we have set its transition to be identity, which means don't do any modifications. So there's no animation, so it just bloop, instantly appears. The text would shrink down to nothing because it's using a scale transition, and the front rounded rectangles would fade out because they have no transition, so they're getting the default opacity. And if face up changed to true, by the way, face up has to be changing here while an explicit animation is in progress. If we're not actually animating, then these transitions mean nothing, right? These transitions don't do the animation themselves. They just specify what view modifiers to use when an animation is happening. So if it is face up changes from false to true, now the back would disappear instantly, just gone. Because again, its transition is the identity view modifier. So it, there's no difference between the identity view modifier when it's there or not there. So it just, it's still going off screen though, so it disappears. The text would grow in from nothing, would start at zero size and whoop, grow up to its normal size. And the front rounded rectangles, since again, no transition specified, they would fade in. And this would all be happening simultaneously. Now, one thing to consider about transition, unlike animation, transition does not get redistributed to a container's content views. Remember I told you that we don't usually put implicit animations on container views because it just ends up give, giving that animation to each of the things inside. Well, transition does not do that. Transition, when you put it on a Z stack or a V stack, it is now talking about the transition of the when the entire Z stack comes on screen or goes off screen. So it does not distribute it off into its things inside. It's actually talking about the animation of the Z stack itself when it comes and goes. Now group and for each, those are container views, but since they don't put anything on screen anywhere, they're just essentially grouping or creating views from a list of identifiables, they do distribute dot transition to their content view. So if you say group and a bunch of things and you say dot transition, it's going to be talking about each one of those things getting that transition. This dot transition function, remember, is doing nothing more than specifying what the two view modifiers are. Think of the word transition there, it's the noun. This is the transition to use. It's not a verb like this view transitions now. Transitions only happen when an explicit animation is going on. That is the only time that 
when transition animations happen. Transitions do not really work with implicit animations. If you try to do implicit animations on views with transitions, it's going to be, get a little confused, and you can understand why this is. Remember that you know explicit animations are for animations that are coordinating a lot of different views. That's when views are coming and going. Implicit animations are for self-contained, independent working views that their animations make sense. That doesn't sound to me like views coming and going. Transitions are not intended to be used with implicit animations. They're to be used with explicit animations. And that's the only time a transition animation will happen is when you are animating it. Transitions are just saying what view modifiers to use. You still have to animate. By the way, if you do an implicit animation on something that has a transition and the view comes or goes, it's going to do some sort of animation, but it's probably not going to be what you expect. The transition API, you know, like creating an actual transition is a little bit interesting and it's type erased. That means that the actual type of a transition, which the real type of a transition is going to have don't cares in there that are the two view modifiers it's using and all that, they could be quite complicated. And we're trying to pass them as arguments to dot transition. We don't want that. So we want it to be simple. The argument to the dot transition function is something called an any transition. And this any transition is a type erase transition. Imagine it's kind of like this that any transition is just a struct that has an initializer that takes a don't care kind of which is a transition that has modifiers and all that stuff and it just knows how to do the transition thing with it and what you get back is just an any transition with no don't cares or any of that business so erasing types like this so that we simplify and lose we don't really lose it but we can't see all the details like what kind of view modifiers and isn't we do that in Swift on a number of cases. You can even do it with a view. There is a view called any view and its initializer will take any kind of view, no matter how complicated and return you in an any view and erase all that information. You'll now you'll have a view. It's called an any view. It's of type any view. You know nothing about what's inside or what's modified or none of that. If you didn't understand what I'm saying there about type eraser, don't worry about it too much. We're going to see it again later in the quarter. But the important thing to realize is that any transition is just a struct. It has some static vars on it for the built-in transitions like opacity, which animates the opacity, scale, which animates the frame modifier to make the frame go down to zero and back up. There's a really important transition for your homework called offset CG size, which causes a view to move across the screen by some offset when it comes and goes. All right, and you're in your homework you're required to make your cards be dealt fly off from off the screen to on the screen so you're going to be wanting to use this offset transition for those views and you can of course create your own transition by just specifying the two view modifiers the modifier view modifier to use when things on screen and to use when it's not right so identity is when it's on the active there is when it's not you can also override the animation that's used for a transition. If you always want a transition to be really fast, for example, or really slow, you can use this dot animation that you attach to the transition. Okay, you don't attach it like a dot animation. Don't get confused by this little thing. This is not implicit animation. Implicit animation, transitions, they don't go together. This is just a way to override the duration and curve and all that of a transition animation so that it always does it this way. Transitions can be thorny and a little bit frustrating sometimes when you're first using them because of this restriction that the container that has the view has to already be on screen. So for example, in your homework assignment three, you are required to have the cards deal out animated fashion onto the screen can't be like Memorize where Memorize launches and up oh, there's the cards already on screen. No, it has to launch temp just momentarily blank and then the cards fly and automatic, you know, have a deal animation to come on the screen. How do you get out of this conundrum of view that contains the cards has to come on screen first and then once it's on screen, then you can 
do something that causes the cards to happen. Well, there's a great function in view for helping with this. It's called on appear. Very simple. It's kind of like on tap gesture, right? On tap gesture, when a tap happens, it calls this closure, executes some code. Well, this is kind of the same. When a view appears on screen, then it calls this code. So we're going to use this nice little feature on our container view. On our container view, we're going to add on appear. And in that code, we're going to change something in our model, probably, that makes it so those cards, which weren't there when my container view first appeared, something about them changed. Now they need to be there. Now they'll get animated coming on screen. We're using the fact that we know in on appear that our container view is finally on screen to go ahead and do some intent to the model that says, okay, you can deal the cards now. And so the model has to change in some way where the cards now are suddenly out being thrown out into the view because the view is just reflecting what's in the model. So if the model says the cards are there when the app launches, they're going to be there. So the cards have to not be there when the app launches. And then after the on appear happens on the container, then something happens where the cards are there. So you've gotten the message, I'm sure, in all this, that the actual animations are done by view modifiers and shapes. They're the things that actually animate. How do they participate in this whole animation system? View modifiers and shapes, how do they get animated? Well, essentially the animation system divides up the duration of the animation into little tiny pieces, depending on the curve. And then it just asks all the shapes and view modifiers that are animatable, here, draw this piece, draw this piece, draw this piece. And it's just drawing them over and over and over and then piecing it together into like a little movie, which is the animation. And that's it. That's how this thing works. It's incredibly elegant and simple to make it work. The communication between the animation system and view modifiers and shapes is just one single var, this var animatable data. This animatable data is in the animatable protocol. It's the only var in there. And all that has you have to do is implement this. And if you're a shape or a view modifier, you can participate in this little piecewise animation. The type of animatable data is a don't care. Actually, it's a care a little bit because that type has to implement the protocol vector arithmetic, which makes sense because we're going to be taking this animatable data, whatever it is, maybe the rotation of the angles of the pi thing or, you know, something like that. We're going to be cutting up into little pieces. So we have to be able to do some math on it to, to cut it up into pieces using that nice curve. So type is almost always a float, either a float or a double or a CG float lots of the time because we're doing a lot of drawing going on here. But there's another struct that implements vector arithmetic called animatable pair. It's really cool. It combines two vector arithmetic things into one animatable vector arithmetic thing. And of course, you can have animatable pairs of animatable pairs, so you can have any number of animatable things. Also, if you had your own complicated structure that encapsulated animation data, you could make it implement vector arithmetic. That's just a protocol, and it could be directly animated. All of the animatable data just has to be something that can be sliced up into little pieces. So it has to implement vector arithmetic. This var, as I said, is communicating both ways between the animation system and the shapes and V modifiers. So the setting of this var, that's the animation system saying, here's a little piece, draw it. Here's a little piece, draw it. So it's just basically saying where in the curve that your little piece of animatable data is during this animation. Now the getting of the var also matters in the animation system to know the start and end of animations. Now, this animatable data, by the way, is usually a computed var, not because it has to be, it definitely doesn't have to be. It's just that in our code, like in our Pi or in our uh, Cardify view modifier, which we're going to modify so that the card flips over, it's rotated. So in there, I really want to call the rotation of my flipping card rotation. I don't want to call it animatable data. That's not a very good name for a var. So a lot of times we're going to create a computed var just to essentially rename uh, uh, some internal var so that the animation system can see it. So let's get right to that demo. Uh, we're going to be doing so many animation things here. 
We are going to do implicit animation, but obviously doing explicit animation. We're going to do transitions. We are going to make a view modifier be modified. We're going to make a shape be modified, all that stuff. And it's a big, long demo. So let's dive into it right now. Let's start our animation demo here with some implicit animation. Again, this is animation where we're going to have some very self-contained animation that's always going to apply no matter what, and it's not really coordinated with a lot of other activity going on in the animation system. What I'm gonna do for this is to have our emojis be really excited and celebrate when they get a match by doing a somersault. So a somersault is essentially rotating the emoji around and rotation is really easy to do in swift ui there is a view modifier for it called rotation effect so i'm going to go down here to my text here's my emoji and i'm just going to add a rotation effect on it and it takes an angle so i'm going to do angle degrees we learned about that when we did our pi i'm going to say if the card is matched then let's start by just having it go upside down, which is 180 degree rotation. We'll eventually have it do a full somersault all the way around and run. Got a card, we're looking for a match. Oh, there it is, and oh, it went upside down. But it didn't uh, do any kind of animation there. It's just as soon as it matched, bloop, they went upside down. So how do we animate this? Well, assuming that I always wanted to do a somersault when a card matches, all I need to do is an implicit animation here and say dot animation. And I just specify the parameters of the animation. So I'm gonna have this animation be a linear one and we'll have it be a duration of, let's say one second. This animation object right here, we talked about in lecture, it's the kind of thing you definitely would want to look over in the developer documentation right here and we can see all the different kinds of animation ease in ease in out linear and all these other things i said we could do delay animations uh, obviously create them with certain durations here's all the springs lots and lots to learn there about animations and we'll be doing quite a few of them today so but let's try this and see if this just works will this now make that happen over one second well here's one uh, and whoo well one of them animated here not both of them let's try another one uh, again it is doing that animation over a second to do that but uh it's not doing this other one now the fact that it's only doing one of these is really there's a good reason for that and we're going to cover that a little bit later for now let's just make sure the one that is working is doing what we want let's have it go to let's say 360 so all the way around. Okay, we're trying to find the match again. There it is. Woo, it's somersault all the way around. How about these guys? Woohoo! And maybe once it's matched, we just are so excited, we just want to keep going somersaults and somersaults. Let's take this animation that we have here, this linear animation, and let's have it repeat forever. So this is doing the same animation, it's just now it's going to keep going. Now the thing is, notice that it does do it, but then it kind of reverses itself, and then it does it again, and it reverses itself. Mm, this is really not what we want. We want it to go around and around. Luckily, repeat forever has a an argument to it here, which is auto reverses, and we'll say auto reverses false. We don't want it to reverse. We just want to keep repeating that animation over and over. And that's because this animation returns to where it started, so it makes sense to keep doing it over and over. The only thing about this animation that we want to be a little careful of here is these cards, remember, eventually we're going to add a new game that you did in your homework. And when we do that, these views get reused. And we don't want this animation to be starting off in a new game. So essentially, whenever the card is not matched, we do not want to be doing this repeat forever. So anytime you do a repeat forever animation, you want to be careful to turn it off when it doesn't apply anymore. You can do that right here just by saying card is matched. We'll do this nice repeating forever. But otherwise, we're going to go back to doing whatever the default animation is. That's kind of like don't do this animation anymore. Just make sure that didn't break anything. Here we go. We got a match. Woohoo! It's working. Okay, it's working. 
now that we've done this implicit animation, let's move on to doing an explicit animation. Before I do the explicit animation, I'm going to implement some of what you did in your homework. Specifically, I'm going to implement shuffling cards, and also I'm going to implement new game. So shuffling card, that's an easy one. Going over to our model over here, and when we create our cards, I'm just going to say cards.shuffle. Obviously, if you haven't done homework one, hopefully you're not watching this video. But next, I'm going to do the new game thing where we have new games, and that's in homework two. Hopefully, you've done homework two. It was due before this lecture. But if you haven't finished homework two, now's the time to pause this video, go submit your assignment two, and then come back and resume watching this. So, card shuffle, that should fix that. Nice one liner. Oh, woohoo, it shuffled. Now these two things aren't right next to each other. All right, well, we can still match them. All right, how about uh, new game? New game requires us to have an intent in our view model, just like we have the intent to choose a card. We're gonna need an intent to create a new game. So I'm gonna call this reset game. And I'm gonna reset the game just by creating a new model. I'm gonna say model equals emoji memory game dot create memory game to create a new memory game and that's all i need to do this is clearly going to change the model that's going to cause this observable object because this model is published all this is going to happen and our whole view is going to redraw because of that change so now i need a button somewhere in my ui right in my ui i don't really have a new game button i can't cause a new game to appear here so i'm going to add a new button at the bottom very simple way i'm just going to have my grid of cards here in a v stack with a button we didn't talk about button and i didn't expect you in your homework number two to necessarily do a button you could easily have just done a text with on tap gesture there that would have been fine but while we're here let's go ahead and learn a little bit about button Button's very simple. It just has an action, which is some closure to execute when the button gets pressed. And then it has this label, which is essentially any view you want to be the label. So I'm going to have the label here be a text that says new game. And in terms of what I'm going to do in this action, let's double click there. I'm going to do that intent that I just talked about. So self.viewmodel.resetGame. Usually when something happens in the UI, like we tap on a card or a button is clicked, we're going to be doing either intents or we're going to be do some, doing something that totally only affects the UI, just adjusts the UI in some way. and doesn't really affect what's in our model. Let's see if our new game button works. We click here, run. Oh, there is our new game down there. And we click. And let's see if it's doing anything. We've got this there and new game. Wahoo! Yeah, I did reshuffle them, put new cards out there. All right, let's see if some cards match, then it puts them back. So our new game button is working. Uh, by the way, what is the difference between using button here and text with on tap gesture? Well, button is powerful. It knows that it's a button. So as it appears on different platforms, maybe Apple TV or Apple Watch or whatever, it's going to draw this button in the way that makes sense on that platform. Whereas if we do text with on tap gesture, it's always going to just look like a piece of text that we tap on. So we would always want to use a button for reals when we are doing a button. We don't want to do a text on tap gesture solution. One other thing I want to mention while we're here is this red new game string. These strings are red and I'm glad they're red. Red usually means, ah, look out, watch out. And indeed you do want to watch out when you have red strings. If you have red strings that are going to appear in front of the user, you need to do a little bit of work, which we're not going to cover now, to make these internationalizable so that you can have this say, new game in French or Chinese or Arabic or whatever. That has to be something that can be fixed. And so we're not going to talk about that. If you're interested in that stuff, Maybe start in the documentation by looking at something called localized string key. That's a way to at least get your strings starting to be localized. There's other things that need to be localized as well, like dates and things like that. Dates appear differently. And again, we don't have time to talk about that. We're talking about animation today. I just want to give you a heads up that that is a thing where we have to be eventually are going to have to be careful about the strings we put in here. 
All right, new game worked, but as we saw over here, uh, it did not animate, right? Do this and oop, it just immediately changed. There's no animation. So we would like this whole thing to be animated. That turns out to be really easy to do using an explicit animation. We're just going to wrap this reset game, which had a big effect on our model and changed all our cards. Well, all those changes we can animate with one simple line of code here with animation. And just like when we did implicit animation, we're going to specify the animation we want. I'm going to use ease in out. Notice I didn't type the full animation dot easing is out and swift can infer that that's the obvious argument to uh, with animation here is that and then it takes a closure with takes no arguments return no arguments and you can put whatever code you want in here and whatever this does to our ui whatever it is it's going to get animated let's see what it looks like to do that Whoop! oh my it actually did a whole bunch of animation there nice now if we want to see exactly what's going on here because there's some other stuff going on there too some fading going on we can change the duration by having an easy in out animation of a duration let's say two or three seconds i'll slow that animation way down which is something i always recommend doing when you're doing animation is to slow things down and see what's going on so here we go let's try a new game Okay, see the cards fade out back to being face down and they move to their new position. That's what's happening here. That is the animation. So why is that happening? That these things are fading out. That ghost, see, he fades out back to his card back. Well, that's because I told you that transition is by default opacity. And what's happening there when we switch that is transitioning to a new view. And so it is fading the new one in and fading the old one out. And we don't really want that. We want our cards actually to flip over when they go from back to front and front to back. We'll fix that in a few minutes. But first, let's use this same feature of explicit animation to make it so clicking on the cards is animated because right now it's very abrupt you click on a card and this thing is i mean instantly appears so that's no good and the exact same thing here's where we're choosing the cards it's some imperative code that we can just say with animation let's go ahead and make this be a linear animation and we'll make it be long as well just so we can really see it in action see what's going on and inside we just do whatever we're going to do that's going to cause a bunch of changes to happen and all those changes will be animated Okay, so there we go. It's clicking and we can see that we're getting this fade in, fade out when we choose a card. And notice I clicked on this card, but it animated every change that happened, including these other cards flipping face down. Right? So that these, when you put this explicit animation, it's going to animate everything that happened as a result of doing what you did there. And that includes something like, let's say there's a match. Let's try and find ourselves a match here. We're not very good at this game, are we? Let's see. Oh, there's a match. By the way, we get our implicit animation there. And if we click on another card here, these two cards are going to disappear. Let's see how they disappear. Oh, they fade out, right? Because that's the default transition. We haven't specified any transitions. We're getting fade in and fade out transitions all over the place here. What if we wanted those things disappearing to be a little cooler animation? Like, how about we'll have them shrink down and disappear? Really easy to do. Again, we're going to go over here to find that view. Where is that view? It's right here. This is the view, this cardified Z stack. And it's only there when it's face up or if the card is not matched. So once the card is matched and is not face up, this view goes away. It transitions out, okay, disappears from the view. And so we can just say transition here and pick, for example, any transition dot scale. So scale is the one that uses frame to make things zoom in down to nothingness or out from nothingness. So let's see if we can find another match here. No, it's hard to do because we have such a slow animation here. Oh, there's a match. Okay, when we click on something else, let's see what happens to animate these cards disappearance. Woo! Now notice that only did they disappear by scaling down, 
But all other animations, including that implicit animation, they kept going. And one thing you're gonna learn about Swift UI is that all animations can be happening all at the same time and they all just work together. It's really, that's one of the nicest things about Swift UI is how it handles all the interactions of animations happening at the same time. Now in your homework, you're going to have cards coming and going as well, but you're not going to have them scale down. You're gonna want your cards to fly across the screen. So they're gonna fly away instead of the screen, you know, shrinking down. And when they're dealt, when they appear on screen, they're going to fly in. You're not gonna have this nice shrinking effect. And adding that transition for these things go, coming and going also makes it so that when they come back, we click on new game and they come back, they should zoom up. This, uh, any transition, remember, is that type erased version of transition. So let's go look at that in the developer documentation really quickly. Here it is, any transition. So here's that identity opacity we talked about, which is the default scale slide, slides out to the side. Uh, down here is offset, which is the one that makes the view fly around coming in and out. So that's probably what you want for your homework. Uh, here's modifier where you get to specify the two view modifiers. This asymmetric, by the way, allows us so that you can have cards come in with one animation and then disappear with another animation if you wanted to. See that any transition says here it's a type erase transitioned. That type erasing is what makes all this very simple right here. It's making the return types of these things not be transition, angle bracket, view modifier, of uh, offset, and it's just any transition. And again, we'll talk more about type erasure uh, later in the quarter. For now, you can kind of ignore it and just think of the transition as just oh, a transition and not worry about all the don't cares and other stuff that might be involved with a non-type erased transition. So the elephant in the room animation here that we don't have is cards flipping over. Really, when we have a card game, these cards, when we click on them, we don't want them fading in like this. We want them to flip over. That's what cards do, they flip. So how are we going to do the flip animation? Well, Swift is gonna help us a lot because it has an animatable view modifier called a rotation 3D effect, which rotates it just like we rotated on a match. If you remember on the match, we rotated in 2D, essentially round and round. We can also rotate in 3D, have this view rotate in 3D around a different axis, this Y vertical axis, instead of kind of rotating around the axis that points straight out at us. So let's do a nice 3D rotation of this card and just see if it works. It's called rotation 3D effect. And you specify how much you want to rotate the card. And here, again, we're going to do angle that degrees. And if the card is face up, then let's not have it rotated, just normal. But if it's face down, let's rotate it 180 degrees. So let's just flip it all the way over. Now this axis, since this is a 3D rotation, this axis is saying around which axis do you want to rotate? And this is three numbers. So for example, 0, 0, 1 would be a 2D rotation because one, the last one here is the Z axis. That's the one that points up out at you from the screen. And what we want is the Y axis instead. That y-axis is a vertical axis, the one that goes from the top of your screen straight down to the bottom of your screen. We want this rotation to happen around that axis. Let's see what that does. It's not going to quite be right. Let's see what we get here. Woo! Wow! So that's kind of interesting. It's it's rotating, but the views appearing and disappearing there. That's still happening with the fade, and that's really not what we want. When we first click the card, both the back and the front are visible. One's fading out, one's fading in. And then by the end, the back is totally faded out and the front has faded in. This is close, it's close. We're, we're on the road to making this work, but it's not quite right. So there's two ways I can think of to make this work. One, we could have our own custom transition, a transition that is transitioning between the back and the front, where the back, kind of, like we're flipping it up, the back is showing for a while and until it gets up on its edge, and then it kind of disappears. And then when the front comes on, it starts out on its edge and then kind of rotates down. We could definitely write 
a view modifier that does that and then make a transition out of it where we're using this sort of half flip up onto its edge to have the card come in and come out. That's slightly more complicated really than I think we need to do because if we remember how animation works, we know that view modifiers are the main things that are doing animation. So why don't we just take our view modifier, which draws this card and make it so that it's smart about it rotating itself so that it only shows the front during the first half of the animation and only shows the back during the second half. In other words, we're gonna have our Cardify over here. Here's our Cardify. When it's rotating, it's, we're gonna make it so it can rotate itself. And as it's doing it, it's gonna coordinate what's face up with the rotation. First half of the rotation, face up will be there. Second half rotation, face down. Well, the first thing we're gonna do is take this rotation 3D effect over here and move it into our modifier. So if we put this over here and have this E stack be rotated over here, instead of having the card rotate in a binary sense between zero and 180, we want the to be able to control the entire rotation of it because in the first half, we only want to show the face up and in the second half, we only want to show the face down. So we're going to kind of change our view modifier here where the main bar that is involved is the rotation. So I'm just gonna have rotation. I'm gonna make it be a double, which is gonna be my amount of rotation in degrees, just to be simple. And if I'm going to track the rotation and animate it, then is face up really just becomes a function of the rotation. If rotation is less than 90 degrees of my 180 degree rotation, then the card is face up. Otherwise, it's face down. So now I've linked rotation and the face up, face down. And then when I have this rotation 3D effect, instead of having the card is face up, control the rotation, let's just do the actual rotation. Whatever the rotation we set this modifier to, that's the rotation it's going to be. And it's going to pick the right face front or not face front rotation of it. Now, I still want to be able to have an init that says is face up. But now when I do that, that's just setting my rotation equal to zero if it's face up and 180 if it's face down. So let's say is face up, question mark zero, otherwise 180. So I've converted my view modifier here to be based on rotation, then face up. And the face up is always tracking the rotation because this is face up. It's just looking at the rotation to see if we rotate it or not. Now, how do we make it so that it animates? Because this is not enough to make it animate. If we just run here and click on these things, it's doing the flip, but it's still doing the wrong thing about the face up and face down. When the face up and face down views come and go here, they're still just having opacity. And that's because this view modifier is not marked as animatable. So Swift UI thinks, well, this view modifier does not, not know how to animate, so I'm just going to do normal animations in here. I'll just animate this normally. It's being switched by the init here to one or the other. And I'm just taking these views that are coming and going because of this face up, and I'm just transitioning them with the standard transition, which is opacity. So we can turn a view modifier, though, into an animatable modifier by changing the protocol it implements to animatable modifier. So animatable modifier really is just view modifier and animatable. And animatable, this is, if we look it up, this animatable data var, this communication between the animation system and our view modifier or our shape. So we just need to implement this animatable data, animatable data inside here. So let's do that. Let's put it right down here. Var animatable data. What does our view modifier animate? It animates the rotation of our view. That's what it animates. So this double is our rotation. Now I could use this word animatable data here instead of rotation, but that's not very nice code to have animatable data here. So let's you do that trick I was talking about on the slides where I'm just gonna have this be a computed property and I'm gonna return my rotation and I'm gonna set my rotation equal to the new value. 
of this property. Remember, get and set, that's how we do computed properties that are read-write, and that's it. So I've essentially just renamed rotation to be animatable data because this is the name that the animation system is going to look for. By the way, you can't, even though this really is all that's going on here, you can't actually just say this. You need to say that this is an animatable modifier because this animatable modifier protocol, while it is just this and view modifier together, it also signals to the system, I want to participate. I'm a view modifier that wants to participate in the animation system. So make sure that you say colon animatable modifier. All right, let's try this. Flip our card. Whoa. Oh my gosh. That really was amazingly easy. See, in the first half of the flip there, when the card's face down, it's only showing the back. And when it's face up, it's only showing the front. And let's try and make a card disappear and see what happens. You can see the cards flip face back down. All right. Here's our match right here. And let me go away. And notice that when it went away, that still worked. That animation worked just fine, the scaling animation. Notice also that when we flip cards over, there's no fade in anymore. These cards are not fading. The back or front is not fading. That's because this view modifier has taken control of the animation. And so the animation system is no longer trying to reach in here and do this animation itself. It assumes that this view modifier knows what it's doing. Let's go back to the problem we had from the very beginning, which is that when things match, let's find some cards that match here. Right, uh, oh, not very good at this game again. Okay, I think this one, yeah. Yeah, okay, ready, here we go, match. This one spins, this one does not spin. Let's investigate why does this not spin. This doesn't spin because this card, when we touched on it, it matched and it was face down at the time and we switched it to face up. So when it came on screen, this all this views right here, it was face up and already matched. So the no change happened. This card is matched was already true, so there was no need to apply any change. Animations only animate changes. And so there was no change because that view came on screen matched. It never changed to be matched. It just was matched when it came on. So if we want a match happening to be animated with the somersault, we need that card, this, this text, basically the front of the card, needs to be on screen when the match happens. But that's a problem for a card, the second card in a match, because it's face down. So that emoji, the front of the card, it's it's not on screen. But we can still have it on screen, but hidden. And that's another way to deal with having views that are appearing and disappearing instead of having them actually be if then out of existence. Instead, we can just hide them. And the way we hide things is with something we already know from last time, opacity. Fully transparent is hidden, and fully opaque is fully visible on screen. So let's use opacity to have the back and front of our card to be showing or not, instead of using an if-then that makes them completely disappear or not. So this is a different way of thinking about what's going on in this Z-Stack. Instead of thinking of it as these front views come when it's a face up and then they go when it's face down, and this one comes when it's face down, this goes face up. Instead, I'm gonna have all four of these always on the card. And when it's face down, I'm not gonna be able to see these three. So let's take these three and I'm gonna even group them to make it easier on myself. And let's set their opacity so that if the card is face up, they're fully opaque, otherwise they're fully transparent. And this one, similarly, will say its opacity is if it's face up, it's fully transparent, otherwise face up. And let's put this, move these things around so they're a little nicer to read. So here, now there's no ifs in here. There are no ifs inside this view builder. Views are not coming and going anymore. It also means that this content, this text, is always on screen, even when we're face down. It's just hidden. So that means that when it gets set to match later, this implicit animation will be a change, and so it'll get to run.
Let's give that a try. There's our card. Whoop. Still worked perfectly there. The front of the card was not showing. See, the front of the card is there right now. It's on the other side of this card, if you want to think of it that way. It's hidden, though. It's opacity is zero. And when I click it, is opacity still zero? Oh, now it's opacity is one, and the back is opacity gets set to zero. So hopefully, if we find a match here somewhere, this guy and this guy, they'll both be spinning. And you can see, as that car turned around, it was spinning. To match another one here this one watch the card as it's turning around you're going to see it's already spinning because it was there hidden and it was spinning hidden until it now became visible this trick of using opacity to make things come and go is really a way that you can control whether you're doing animation by abuse coming and going with transitions or whether you're controlling it directly on screen using opacity and both of them perfectly valid ways to go. You can just decide whether it makes sense or not. Later in this demo, you're going to see that we actually are going to take advantage of making our little pie come and go. When our pie is animating, we want it there as an animating thing, but we're going to put a different pie out there when it's not. And there's going to be a huge advantage to knowing when it's coming and going. So it's not always the case that you want to use opacity. Sometimes you want the views coming and going. It just depends on whether you're triggering things off of that and whether you want to use transitions or just normal animations. Now, the last thing I'm going to do here is now that we have our animation working pretty well for flipping cards and for having them disappear, I'm going to speed them back up again. And then we're going to go work on the animation of this little pie. So let's speed them back up. That's easy to do. Go back here and just make our durations Maybe we have the default durations. Let's try the default durations of both of these. Usually under a second, most of the default durations. Let's see what this looks like. That might be a little quick. Actually, I'm, I'm not super happy with that. I'm okay with the disappearing that fast, but when flipping the cards, I want to slow it down a little bit. So I'm going to say duration, let's say 0 0.75. See how fast that looks. Okay, that looks better to me. You know, certainly wouldn't want to be any slower than that, but I think that looks pretty good. This blue would obviously be something we want to put down in our drawing constant. So I'm not going to do it right now for time savings, but anytime you see a blue number in there, these blue numbers here also we didn't do from last time, these things should all be put down here in drawing constants so that you have a control panel down here to tweak and turn the dials to make your UI look how you want. We have this pie. And right now the pie is stuck in this position right here. But we really, whenever a card flips up, we want it to start counting down. And when it flips back down, we stop counting. And then flips back up, it keeps counting. And then flip down, it stops counting. And then, of course, when it matches, then we stop counting because now you've matched it. And if it totally disappears, you don't get as many points as if you, you do it before it disappears. To do this, we got a couple of things that we have to do. One is we're going to have to kind of enhance our model to know how much bonus time is left and all that. So I have actually put some code in here that I made available to you guys on the forum before. So you, you students all have it. If you don't have it, you can pause this video actually and copy it from here if you can't get a hold of it uh, some other way. But what this code is basically doing is tracking every time the card comes up and down or gets matched, it's tracking the time used and then it answers questions like how much time is remaining or what percentage of the time is a uh, is remaining and we can learn whether we earn the bonus and start using the bonus time and stop using the bonus time by the way these functions i got to make sure i call these when the car goes face up and face down in my model and also when it's matched so let's use that property observers we talked about to call those functions here is my cards bars and i'm going to make it so that every time is face up changed here and i'm going to use did set i showed will set in the slides but i'm just being different here and showing a did set when this happens i'm going to say if the is face up changed to true so the card went face up then i'm going to start that bonus time running again start using the bonus time otherwise if the card went face down i'm going to stop using the bonus time 
So I'm just watching this face up and face down in my card, and whenever it changes, that happens. And this is more reliable than trying to look at all the times I say is face up true or false and try to also call start use, using bonus time then I might make a mistake and forget it somewhere or whatever. This way, it's just reliable. Every time I change this, boom, we start and stop the time. And similarly for is matched here, when it's set, we can stop using bonus time. If is matched is set to false, probably maybe we're resetting the game or resetting the card. I'm not sure what we're doing there, but it seems like the bonus time shouldn't start going again. This property observer, really powerful way to sync up what's going on inside your code. So now our model knows how much time is remaining on the bonus and all that stuff. That's what all this code I did down here. So let's use that stuff in our UI to show that animation. Now for our card pi to animate, we have to enhance our shape over here to do animation. Now shapes really already have this animatable, the same protocol we had with view modifier. It's pretty much on all shapes. All shapes are assumed to be able to do animation. It's just kind of part of being a shape. It's, it's so common that we don't even have to say comma animatable here. Shape just assumes that you're gonna do it. Now, if you don't put animatable data, you won't get any animation and it'll build, but usually we want it. So what do we wanna animate here in our Cardify view modifier, we animated our rotation as we went around. Well, in our animation of the pie, kind of want to animate this angle. See this angle that go here? As it goes around, this angle is going to change of the end angle here. And if we're going to be a good pie, let's make it so both angles can be animated, the starting one and the ending one. That way we can animate either side, depending on what we thought looked nice. So how do I animate two things as, at once, essentially? Well, I'm going to use that animatable pair, right? And the animatable pair is going to be a pair of doubles. Those doubles are going to be my angles here. Uh, they're in radians. Angle itself is not a vector arithmetic thing, but obviously the angle in radians is a double, so that is. So this animatable data, again, I'm going to use the same trick of having the get and set a little trickier because we have to use animatable pair here, but animatable pair just has two vars, first and second, which return the first animatable thing and the second animatable thing. So for us, we're just going to return an animatable pair. And the first thing is going to be the start angles radians. And the second one is the end angles, angle radians. That's getting our animatable data. And then setting it is just setting our start angle to be an angle whose radians are this animatable pairs, which is the new value, dot first. And the end angle is an angle radians, which is the animatable pairs second. So here we have connected up two of our vars to this animation, piecewise animation. And that is it. That is all we need to do because it just means that this shape is going to be redrawn over and over during animation with, with these two things being animated because they're the things that are being sliced up into little pieces by the animation system. That's what animatable data is all about. And I, I told you this animation system is elegant and it is having just this one var as being the only entry point in both directions in something to animate pretty nice design, I, I think. And I don't work for Apple, so this is an independent third party. In my opinion, I think they did a good job of that. All right, so now this pie is animatable, and now our model knows how to keep track of the time remaining. So let's take our view and put those two things together. So here's our pie right here. And we wanna, I'm gonna leave the start angle always straight up zero degrees up at the top. I'm going to vary my end angle depending on how much time I have remaining. Let's start with a simple one, which is let's take the cards bonus remaining, which is the percentage bonus remaining it has, times 360. And of course, I'm going backwards because this pi is negatively going down to zero. I eventually want this to be down to zero. Let's see what that does. All right, here we go. Oh, it's not animating. Huh, that's weird. So, oh, but I thought I saw something there. Oh, look, 
so it is actually showing us the time remaining because I had that card up for about mm, that much. I think this is six seconds I set it to be to go around. So I think that card was a face up for about four seconds. So it did, but it didn't actually animate it. And then this one, look, it looks like all the time is there. But if I click away and then click back, oh, actually I used up all the time because that card was sitting face up so long. Now this one I think was only up for a little bit. Yeah, see, that was only up for a tiny bit. This one just showed up. So it's actually working. It's adjusting this, but it's not animating it. So how are we going to animate it? There's a bit of a challenge to animate this because what this is really animating is this angle going from where it is now, like right here, around to zero. And I told you that animation only shows you things that have already happened, but the, when the card appears, this clock starts going, it hasn't gotten to zero yet. So how do I start an animation that's gonna have this thing go to zero when zero hasn't happened yet? That's a little bit of a conundrum, a catch-22 there. So this catch-22 is going to prevent us from using this bonus remaining directly from the model. Now, if I ask the model, what's the bonus? remaining percentage, it'll tell me the right answer. It always does. That's the model's job. So the model's doing its job. However, the model is not constantly changing. Oh, there's 4.1 seconds left. Oh, I changed. Now there's only four seconds left. Oh, I changed. Now there's 3.9 seconds left. The model can't be doing that. That's ridiculous. It's doing its job, but it does it in a way that it's not causing our UI to change and animations only animate change. We just can't use this directly from the model. We still have to be in sync with the model, but we can't use this directly. So I'm gonna animate this angle using my own little temporary bar here. It's gonna to have to be writable. I'm gonna to have to sync it up with the model. So it is gonna be an at sign state as we talked about in the slides. And it's private, it's just for me to use. It's a bar, I'm gonna call it my animated bonus remaining. We'll make it be a double the number of degrees and of course it has to be initialized because all vars have to be initialized even the ones that are at sign state so i'm going to use that instead of the bonus remaining directly from the model i'm going to use my animated bonus remaining now somehow i have to make this be the right values to cause an animation to happen the first thing that i have to do is get it to be synced up with the model this has to be synced up with the model how am I going to do that? Well, really, when do I want it to be synced up? Every single time this view comes on screen, I want it to sync with the model. Now, when does this come on screen? Right now, it comes on screen with its container. We don't get any transitions. We don't know when that happens, etc. So I'm going to make it only be on screen if my card is consuming bonus time. So this is just a var I have in my model that tells me whether a card is currently at the moment consuming bonus time. That means it's face up, it's not matched yet, there's some bonus time remaining, it might be other things, but I don't care, it's up to my model to tell me whether bonus time is currently being consumed. And if it is, then this view is gonna be on screen. Now, why do I only want this to be on screen when it's actually animating? Well, because I'm using this animated value as the bonus remaining, Okay, that really, I only want to be doing that when I'm actually animating. And also, it lets me use on appear. So you remember on appear, we talked about in the slides, this is a function that calls this closure anytime this view appears on screen. And that's exactly what I want because every time this thing appears on screen, I'm going to reset this, my bonus time remaining up here, to be what's in the model. So this view is always going to start out synced up with the model. Then I can proceed to animate it, but we got to get it synced up. So let's do that in a little function up here, another little private. We call it this funk uh, start bonus time animation, let's say. And the very th first thing I want to do in here is to set my animated bonus remaining equal to what's in the model so that I'm always in sync. I'm always going to call this thing start bonus time animation. Every single time this pie comes on screen, it's going to sync up with the model. Really important if you're going to be having your own version of something that's in the model that you want to animate, at least have it sync up when it first comes on screen. So now what do I need to do? My pie comes on screen. 
it's showing the right amount of bonus time remaining, but now it wants to animate ticking down to zero. So I'm just gonna do exactly what I just said, animate ticking down to zero. With animation, let's use a linear animation, please tick down to zero. I'm just animating my bonus remaining ticking down to zero. But wait a second, how long is it going to take to do this animation? Well, it better be however much time is left, right? I don't want it to tick down to zero slower or faster than the time remaining. So I'm just gonna have my animation's duration equal the card's bonus time remaining. That's how many seconds are left. This is the percentage left, in the, and this is the number of seconds left. So that's it. So this is really all I need to do. I just have my own little bonus time remaining here, which I sync up to the model and then immediately start animating towards zero. If, if pi stays around that long, we're going to see the animation go all the way to zero. If it stops consuming bonus time, this view is going to go away. It won't have finished its animation maybe, but that's okay. It's just going to disappear here. Now, what if we're not consuming bonus time? Like, let's say the cards are matched. They've already been matched, not consuming bonus time. I actually still want a pie up there. I just don't want it to be animating. That's easy. In the else case right here, I'm going to put a pie there as well. Now, this pie, we don't care when it appears because we're not animating, and it certainly can't use this animated bonus remaining. That's what this pie appears about. So let's just have it match up with whatever it says in the model. Now, I don't like to have duplicated code here. See this padding and opacity on both of them? So let's take this out of here. And instead, we'll use a group around this whole thing to apply padding and opacity to. This hopefully should cover all the bases here. This is the pie when it's animating. When it appears, we sync up with the model and then start it going towards zero with however much time is left. And if we're not consuming bonus time, we're not animating, then we'll just do a normal pie with the bonus remaining. See if that works. All right, let's watch. Woo, look at that, it's animating over this one. Oh, they even matched. This is a great example here because this one matched as soon as I clicked it, so I didn't use any of my bonus time. So that looks right. And then this one, as soon as I had a match, it switched over to using this pie down here. It's just showing me how much I had remaining when the thing matched. All right, let's look at another one here. Ghost and this guy. Let's click away from these. And this one's starting and go back and see if the bonus time that was remaining when we went face down continues. Ooh, it did. Ooh. Okay. See what's going on there? All right. Simple as that. Now, this was a little trickier to do than some animations, but it is not uncommon to have a situation like this where your model or whatever your data source can tell you what's going on, but it's not constantly changing. And that's why sometimes you'll have to create your own var here that you can animate towards, but make sure you sync it up with the model before you do it. Okay, that is it for animation today. We covered a lot of ground. We talked about implicit animations where we had the somersaulting emojis being so excited that they had a match. We had a couple of explicit animations. We did one right here when we chose a card. We did another one right here when we did a new game. We also showed animating view modifiers. We had our card here be animating. We even showed how to not have views coming and going if we didn't want them coming and going. We animated our shape. And all we had to do there was say what data inside of our shape is animatable, which in our case was the start and end angle over here. And we also did some transitions, right? We had this scale transition so that when cards match, they would disappear. By the way, we could do a similar kind of transitions with these pies up here. If we put, for example, a transition on the pie of dot scale, then when our pie appears, you can see it kind of zooms in, which is kind of a good look. Right, kind of zooms in. If we don't have scale, it, I don't know if you noticed before, but it was actually kind of fading in. Or maybe we might want to say we don't want any of that and we're just going to use an identity transition. And then this pie, when it comes and goes, it's just going to appear, which is fine because it's usually happening when the card is face down or it's switching between two pies that have the exact same value if we are matching.
that is it for animation. Hopefully that's all you'll ever need to know about animation. I mean, of course, animation's powerful subsystem. We didn't have to add very many lines of code to our app to make it do all these crazy things, but I haven't shown you every possible way you could use in, in animation by any means. So there's still a lot to learn, but at least you know the basics now. Next week, I'm not sure exactly what we're gonna do next week. Either we're gonna do some gestures, possibly, you know, pinch gestures and things like that. Or we might actually do text fields and pickers. And I saw that question on the class forums about that. And maybe we'll do that. I'm not exactly quite sure where we're going to go next week. But uh, stay tuned and you'll find out then. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.